Thank you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about the progress that we've made over the last year in our clinical trials. And I've been told the receiver's over there, so I have to point in that direction. So we are a publicly traded company, so here's our forward-looking statements. Um, and these are the company highlights. At our base, we are an ophthalmology gene therapy company. We have a clear vision for how we want to deploy our technology. We have deep expertise in the technology itself, how you design and manufacture and deliver these therapies. And we have an extensive IP portfolio, having been working in this space for over a decade. And we have a key partnership with Biogen that I'll talk about in a few moments. We do have a comprehensive platform, and I think at this meeting you've probably heard a lot about the components of AAV vectors, adeno-associated virus, that there's a capsid, that there's promoters driving gene expression, there's the gene cassette itself, and in the eye especially, formulation is very important, as well as manufacturing, getting that to be robust and consistent with high quality uh, commercial grade an analytics, and then exactly how you administer the vector. And we have developed a wide range of expertise across all of these components. And I think the most important factor is that different components of the vector are important in different clinical in indications. We are completely agnostic as to what capsid we're using, what vector, what promoter we're using, we just want it to be the best, to provide the best clinical result to the patient, whether we develop that component in-house or whether we work with collaborators to develop the component. This is our product um, pipeline, and as you can see, it's quite extensive. I think that some people are very surprised when they dig into the details about how much activity is ongoing in clinical trials at our company. We have four ongoing clinical trials in four inherited retinal diseases. I think an important component of these retinal diseases is that we have chosen indications that have quite large patient populations, even though they're still orphan indications. And as you can see from the key platform line, for each each indication, something is very important about the specific clinical phenotype that drove the design of the product. For XLRS, it's a very fragile retina, did not want to do subretinal injections, it's an intravitreal injection. We designed the whole rest of the product around that component. For achromatopsia, it's a cell membrane protein that is missing, and so it's very important to only express that cell membrane protein in cones, and so we developed a very specific promoter that only allows expressions in cones and built the rest of the product around that. So really using our deep technical expertise to specifically hone in and design these uh, uh, vectors for the specific clinical phenotype. You'll also see that two of the programs are, are licensed to Biogen. Uh, this was an opportunity that we had to really diversify the risk of our portfolio and share that risk with Biogen and develop that together and capitalize on their expertise in late stage clinical development as well as commercialization. They've been a wonderful partner to work with. A key aspect of that partnership though is that we will have the opportunity when we see all the data, so the data from all four clinical programs, when we see that data, we'll have the opportunity to potentially buy into the programs with Biogen and recognize more of the upside of that specific indication, thus allow us, uh, us to rebalance our risk at a future point in time. So I'm not going to spend much time on why ophthalmology. I think a lot of people have talked about ophthalmology as being a good space for AAV gene therapy. But I will t talk a little bit about, about the figure that's on your right-hand side, and that is a blow-up of the retina. And it's just to drive home again the point that not all diseases in the eye are created equal, that you have to develop your vector specifically for the fi uh, clinical indication you're working on. Because these cells in the retina are very highly differentiated, and depending on which disease you're working on, you're going to want to target your vector to a different cell type. And so how you do that with capsid and promoter and physical delivery is quite important. So you have to have a very good understanding, not just of your vector design, but the actual clinical phenotype and how the mechanism of action works for the protein you're working with. So our, our lead product candidate that's licensed to Biogen is XLRS, or X-linked retinoschisis. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the indication itself. It is uh, quite prevalent in the, in the U.S. and EU, about 35,000 patients. 
It's a structural protein that's missing, so which means the layers of the retina come apart, which means the electrical signal of vision can't get back to the brain. And so these p patients have very poor vision and are also at a high risk of having retinal detachments or vitreal hemorrhages, which can dramatically affect their vision. So we have completed enrollment in this clinical trial, a total of 27 patients in a standard dose escalation pattern. And at this time, the nine active turtles clinical sites have, as I said, enrolled the patients. There's been 12 patients in dose escalation, five children were enrolled in an expansion cohort, and then a high dose expansion cohort of additional 10 patients. At this time, we are screening and enrolling additional pediatric patients at that high dose. And our guidance to the street has been that by the end of this year, we will give the interim uh, top line results from this trial, which will be the six months worth of data on all 27 patients. There, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these uh, next two slides, which talk about endpoints, but endpoints are very important in ophthalmology. Depending on the indication, different endpoints may become more important. In XLRS, we think visual fields is going to be a critical endpoint to look at, as well as visual acuity. So a chromatopsy is our next indication that's in the clinic. There are actually uh, several different genes that cause the same clinical phenotype, and we have two ongoing clinical trials to treat the two most prevalent genes, the, a, the CNG B3 and A3. Uh, and these are, as I said, cell membrane proteins that create the channel in the cone membrane that allows a photon of light to come in and trip the phototransduction cascade. So no channel, no light comes in, no vision from the cones, which means all these patients are legally blind, and they are also extremely light sensitive. This would be a nightmare of, the room, of a room for them to be in, and especially with these bright lights. They would actually end up having their rods wa washed out and be completely blind in this kind of situation. So a, a very severe indication that affects quality of life, what choices they have in school, what choices they have in careers. So as I said, there's two ongoing clinical trials. In the B3 trial, uh, we are now at the middle dose cohort. Uh, in the A3 trial, we're in the lower dose cohort. And just as a summary status, uh, um, as of our September conference call, uh, we had enrolled eight patients in the Chromatopsia B3 trial, two in the A3 trial. We have five sites each active for these trials, and we're actively bringing on additional sites. And in fact, we just uh, initiated our first international site in Israel uh, because Chromatopsia A3 is actually quite prevalent in Israel. So we're working with Hadassah Medical College in Jerusalem, um, and they they are currently screening and enrolling patients. So in a chromatopsia, as I said, the endpoints you look at are going to be different depending upon the clinical indication. And in a chromatopsia, not only are they legally blind and have light sensitivity, but they actually also have no color vision whatsoever. It's not like X-linked color blindness, but they, have, they only see in black and white and shades of gray. So one of the endpoints that's important in a chromatopsia and maybe not other indications is a color vision test. And so we're working on several different color vision tests that we're implementing in our clinical trials. In addition, these patients, as I said, are extremely light sensitive. And in fact, light sensitivity is what they complain about the most. It's the most significant impact to them on their quality of life. So we worked with researchers at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, Florida, to come up with a brand new novel test to test for light sensitivity. And we think this is going to be critically important. And based on the new FDA draft guidance, where they've indicated that they're very open to novel endpoints and working with with uh, researchers and developers on novel endpoints, we think that this can be an important and approvable endpoint for the trial. The final uh, uh, clinical trial I'm going to talk about today is a, a trial for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, or XLRP. This is another program that is partnered with, Genza, uh, with uh, Biogen. And this is another mechanism of action. This actually affects both rods and cones, um, and it's a transport protein. So many people might understand that photoreceptors have both inner and outer segments, and to have the complete phototransduction cascade, you have to move proteins between the inner and outer segments. 
treatment, and that's what's missing here. So if you can't complete that phototransduction cascade and transport those proteins, you have no vision. This disease, unlike XLRS and achromatopsia, which are stable diseases, XLRP is a degenerative disease over time. Um, and so what we're measuring here, first and foremost, is a stabilization of visual function, where in uh, XLRS and achromatopsia, we're looking for improvements in visual function. Uh, this again, this is uh, the graphic should look very familiar by this point. It is a dose escalation trial and then an expansion in the maximum tolerated dose. And uh, we have treated now a total of five patients as of the September conference call. We have three sites actively enrolling patients and are, are bringing on more sites uh, in a continual basis. Because this was a, par a program partnered with Biogen, uh, we did recently receive two milestones from Biogen, uh, two and a half million dollars for the first patient and $10 million for the fourth patient enrolled in this trial. I'm going to move forward to talk a little bit about what is going to be our next clinical program, so the next IND that is being worked on at the company. And this is a partnership with a medical device company out of New York called Bionic Sight. And it is a new, a next generation realization of optogenetics technology. So many of you may have heard of optogenetics. So this would be applicable to patients who have lost their photoreceptors, so we can't restore function to the photoreceptors. So you use a light sensitive protein to turn other cells in the eye into on off signals for light recognition. What Bionic Sight brings to the table and helps us with is two things. One is a novel pro light sensitive protein that has a wider range of frequencies that can trigger it. So it's a wider amount of light levels that can trigger the protein, thus allowing a greater visual band for these patients. And then on top of that, there's a wearable, non implanted uh, device that recodes that incoming light into a pattern that a primate ret retina can recognize more easily. Easily. And that means that not only are these patients going to be able to see light and dark in contrast, but the, the goal is to allow them to see objects so they can recognize a face, they can recognize a dog, a chair, a table, and have much more high level visual uh, functioning than from standard optogenetic programs. And so we will be filing this IND with Bionic Sight in uh, 2019. So another area that I'm just going to talk very briefly about is otology. We think that otology is very similar to ophthalmology. A lot of the structures in the ear have similar kinds of functions to structures in the eye, and we can apply what we've learned in ophthalmology to otology. And we are working on a wide number of different indications in this area and making sure that we understand what is the appropriate routes of administration, the appropriate capsids, the appropriate promoters to use for the different indications, much the same way as we are in ophthalmology. So a lot of parallels there. And then I'm just going to close uh, as I try to click quickly. I'm going to close with uh, what we think is, is, is uh, very important, and that is our financial strength. We have, uh, as of our last report, $105 million of cash on hand. This does not include the milestones we've recently uh, received from Biogen. And what this means is that we have the resources, both financial and from an internal FTE perspective, to get all four sets of data from these ongoing clinical programs, as well as to get that optogenetic program filed um, and uh, in the first few patients, which means over the next uh, year to 18 months, there are many uh, opportunities for value creation as we turn over these data cards in this wide variety of programs that we're working on. So I thank you for your time. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk to you about the progress that we've made, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>